I think the world needs a different slant and I want to be part of that game uh, and that is a more human, a more, um, I'd say, uh, collaborative and open uh, and welcoming way of uh, working together and, uh, and, and sort of acknowledging that body, mind and spirit need to be formed together, particularly in the world of work. So that uh, sort of made me then step out of uh, where I was and uh, for me to then create what today is called soul works, basically in the name itself, bringing together soul and works and having that harmonize um, in a far more, I think, impactful way if we bring these worlds together. <laughs> Today I have the wonderful pleasure to uh, invite and have Anna Julia von Winterfeld on our show, Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Anna is a human leadership activist, purpose advocate, culture designer, and business hippie. Julia worked for 20 years in Berlin, New York, New Delhi, and London for international digital marketing and technology companies, Publis Pixel Park, Publis Sapient, Accenture, and most recently as MD for AKQA Germany. In 2015 and 16, she was selected among the top five of the most important agency managers in Germany, founded her own company and collective SoulWorks in 2015. Since then, she has led more than two dozen progressive-minded small-medium businesses as, a well, as well as corporate and family businesses through her personally developed Purpose Quest and Leadership Reset formats. In doing so, she accompanies companies to grow in their great challenges and see purpose as the linchpin for establishing and embedding new ways of working. She also accompanies executives to radically rethink their role, look within and go beyond with her immersion programs, Fearless Soul and Being Exponentially Human, enabling them to powerfully grow themselves and their companies. She appears as a speaker and presenter in the context of new work, human leadership, cultural change and purpose on various stages. Her purpose is to awaken leaders in radically rethinking who they truly are and her ambition, her why, her purpose is to set free the limitless potential of over 1 million people before she leaves this planet. Yulia, welcome to the show. And I hope you don't leave the planet for a long, long time <laughs> and that, that it's well more than a million people that you've touched. Thank That's you for fine. being on the show. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's wonderful to hear this uh, and to be, to have it mirrored back to me. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's wonderful actually to hear that story, I have to say. And uh, you're absolutely right. I also hope not to leave this planet before more than one million people, uh, plenty more are touched. But it's always good to set a first goal. That's great. You, you've touched my soul and we met, I believe it was around 2014 is when we first right. met and it was at an M Love event in a castle, beautiful castle setting, Heiligen Damm area, um, had, a, had a fabulous time and we've kept a, a close uh, relation and friendship since then and I, mm. I've really cherished it ever since, but you've also had numerous journeys since then. And the most recent one that I was fortunate enough to do was, was last year in Italy in a place called Eremito. Um, you'll have to remind me how <laughs> you use Lombardo. Is it close to Lombardo? It's in, in uh, well, Umbria, in fact. Um, it's Umbria. in Umbria. Yeah. Umbria, that's yeah. right in a um, um, cloister, a monastery, a kind of a convent uh, renovated into a hotel, a five-star designed hotel. Yeah. And I had the most wonderful recharging experience with you there. Uh, mm. That's one of your being hu uh, exponentially human events mm. that in workshops that you do. Um, 
ex immersive experience really mm -hmm. um, and I so needed it last year I did something like 200 plus events and was all over and I was starting to wear down I was starting to get tired and I did this digital detox went to your event and oh my goodness I I was able to make it clear till now and even further and learn so many things so I thank you so much and and uh, just to give our listeners a little bit of background of how we know each other and and that we've had more than just uh, Zoom interactions with each other. So yeah. um, since that time, I, I because you have this this pretty wonderful, beautiful journey up until now, I would mm -hmm. like you to see if you could kind of update me where where the journey has taken you, but how you started Soul Works and what led you down that path and kind of give us an update to present. And then I, then I want to ask you a different question about how that has helped prepare you for this difficult time for the pandemic. Yeah, perfect. No, so let me, um, first of all, thank you, um, Mark. I, I'll we'll speed back up to where we uh, then left each other end of last year in Umbria. But yeah, what did actually want me to then take um, charge of creating my own environment and with that creating soul works um, you already nicely uh, spoke about my being in digital environments um, i was uh, in my last role really very thankful very grateful for what i was able to do to really um, enable large corporations to take on the digital world and to yeah help them in creating digital products and services and it was that time where i then realized for myself can it just be that we are fully focused on digital and not thinking about the human side and um that began to sort of get me thinking um am i purely on this digital course and not really thinking about the human side do i want that and then i equally started to think about my own leadership being uh, running that business uh, and seeing sort of my possible career steps um, the next thing that would need to happen would be for me to really perform on a numbers game and then i would be able to pr promote or be promoted to the next level and I started to question that model as well. Like, um, is that really what leadership is about? To um, you know, excel myself on a numbers game and then uh, reach the next level. Um, and uh, and that really then uh, aside to I have to admit um, all of the pressures and the responsibilities that I was taking on. I wasn't feeling comfortable anymore in my in my body and said no i think the world needs a different slant and i want to be part of that game uh, and that is a more human a more um i'd say uh, collaborative and open uh, and welcoming way of uh, working together and uh, and and sort of acknowledging that body mind and spirit need to be formed together particularly in the world of work so that uh, sort of made me then step out of uh, where I was and uh, for me to then create what today is called soul works, basically in the name itself, bringing together soul and works and having that harmonize um, in a far more, I think, impactful way if we bring these worlds together. So yes, this is what I've been doing uh, for five years and I'm gonna um, you know, come back to where uh, you, kindly spoke about our being together in Umbria. For me, it's, uh, it's just, um, it's really a gift. It's a gift to be able to uh, spend my time and spend my energy in enabling uh, through providing space, uh, through providing different forms of um, getting to know oneself, but also being in interaction with others and co-creating together. Um, it's a gift to, uh, to yeah, enable leaders or enable individuals uh, to have that contact of um, being who they truly want to be. Yeah. Did you um, get a lot of feedback from that event that others saw it as, as their form of reset, their form of disconnection from uh, digital detox and a way to not only tank up 
their bucket, their soul mm -hmm. um, to, to continue to go on, but also to find that purpose, mm -hmm. uh, whether it was new or not, or whether it was just ingrained that they discovered their purpose within themselves to move forward in, in a different light. And as, have you heard any positive stories or any, anything that you could share with us? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, um, for me, it's sometimes um, uh, a little bit unfortunate when I'm hearing that individuals join these, um, uh, these retreats uh, that we conduct because they are at a sort of at a low uh, point. Um, either they're just exhausted or individuals are not seeing any orientation for themselves anymore or they are in need of um, yeah, being clear as to where their path needs to continue. So it always seems as though there's a certain low point that they've reached and therefore come. And absolutely, uh, the stories or, or what's, you know, provided to me is positive reinforcement for myself that this is the right, uh, the, the right thing at the right time is um, that, yeah, one story, I am now able to really acknowledge what my company can be bring into the world and how I am part of this. Um, this is uh, an individual who uh, took over the business from his father and uh, at first didn't really want to have this role, uh, was unclear where to take this company. Um, unfortunately, um, uh, it was uh, due to a crisis uh, in his family that he then had to take on this role. And um, yeah, really came out of it stronger, knowing that this is exactly where he needs to be right now and had, a cl had clarity in how his company needs to unfold in order to not only make it in a, a wonderful place to be for everyone involved, but also how this company can be of impact uh, in, in the outer world, let's say. That's so beautiful. It, um, yeah, definitely gives me um, this, uh, yeah, this knowing that, uh, that the world needs more of this. Again, coming back to the point, it's a shame that we all do seem to have to have a certain low point in order to feel accelerated uh, to, um, yeah, go on such trips. Mm. Yeah, sometimes we need that reset or that very low point or depression or, or whatever it may be it's some kind of something very impactful that's uh, usually in a negative way you know uh, environmental reasons or emotional or uh, something that hits us pretty hard and it, sh it shakes us and if we can find the right tools the right people the right formats to to pull us through that to see the hope to see the purpose to yeah. discover that even though it was his uh, family business and uh, he inherited that he could make it his own and find purpose within and make it something beautiful and wonderful that he would enjoy doing every day instead of feeling oh i was just born into this situation and now i'm stuck with this burden that there's other ways to look at things and so that's a that's a really beautiful beautiful story. I um, I, I hope it's okay to mention I was able to uh, speak to you guys for a couple hours about yeah. you know being exponentially human um, uh, in regards to climate change and how we see ourselves as an integral part of Homo symbiose within our planet and with each other that. Um, you know, we might, uh, 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 and this sound could sound very technical or very out there, but our world is growing exponentially all around us. And the things that we've dealt with in the past that deal with the exponential function is usually technology or some form of innovation that we've seen. But there's a way to use that for our benefit, not only the exponential function, but we as human beings, as homo sapiens, are actually from our birth growing exponentially. We're changing and evolving and every day. The cells, our skin, our largest organ on our body, our, mm. our skin, our epidermis, uh, loses cells and regenerates cells in our body in, in the millions, uh, hundreds of millions each and every single day and die in that regenerative process. 
but we're evolving exponentially. And if we can reconnect with that uh, core and understand how to kind of live in harmony and to, to use that for our benefit, boy, things not only speed up, so to say, but the, the, the path and the plan, the journey is so much nicer. And uh, that's right. Uh, yeah, I, even, even though we, we had that discussion um, and it, it was beautiful, I learned so much and had some wonderful takeaways <laughs> that really tanked and charged up my soul. That brings me to this um, question because you've had several journeys and adventures and, and uh, just life moments uh, uh, throughout your time that I would think, and I, I don't know, and that's why I'm asking you, ha had well prepared you for this pandemic, this pause, this reset. I see that you're not living in a prison or mm -hmm. a human zoo that you've, or your human zoo is designed very comfortably. So I'm sure you didn't get cabin fever or go stir crazy. But how has all, all your life to this point prepared you maybe resiliently, sustainably, or in one way or the other to, to weather this period and give us an insight or look to what that, that's been like, any aha or learning moments that he says, I'm so glad I went through this then, so it's making now a lot easier. Things like that would be wonderful to hear. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you would think, right, that uh, with all of the inner work that, <laughs> that I've uh, applied to my own self, uh, that I would be prepared for this kind of uh, uh, situation and that the pandemic would be easy for me uh, to face. And um, yeah, I mean, even the thought that you just shared, uh, I cannot, um, you know, I, I, I cannot complain. I have a, a beautiful home. Uh, and a space where I can really move in uh, appropriately. And yet still, I have to admit um, that this whole crisis certainly affected me emotionally. Um, at first, I went into a modus of um, activism. Um, I really sort of went into, okay, how can I apply myself and provide myself to others? Um, meaning, first of all, my clients, uh, but also uh, people that uh, may need some kind of service from me. So I went in this complete activism, which um, had me do online soul talks um, and um, online energizers uh, to also just reach out and, and, and be visible on the one side, but also have um, uh, this ability to, to yeah, connect with others. And then um, sort of in, in sort of recollection um, going back, um, I think it was like in week three where I then just basically emotionally crashed. Um, and I think, you know, this, this notion of activism got, didn't allow me not to face what was happening. Uh, whereas then I think week three, I then realized, wow, what are we actually experiencing here? And, um, and what, how is it really affecting me? So I uh, then really, as of week three, started to, think about knowing that this isn't going to be over quite soon. Um, how is it really affecting me? And what am I really feeling um, in this? How am, I, um, how am I sort of attaching myself to, uh, to all that's going on? So I um, yeah, emotionally crashed in that I really felt the pain um, uh, of this world um, and uh, the pain of um, not being in social contact with others. Um, obviously, then being here at home, um, starting to think about, okay, well, how are you now going to deal with this, Julia? What are you, what are you going to do at home? Uh, work is one thing. Um, thankfully, I have my partner here at home, so I wasn't completely isolated. But even this uh, interaction with my partner, um, how do we want to now live uh, in our own zoo, as you said. Um, and I really did learn that I needed a routine. Um, I felt as though I already had a routine prior, but obviously it wasn't in my own four walls. Um, so having a routine of getting up um, and taking that time to meditate, uh, to do body work, um, and uh, to use a very strict sort of one hour is me time. 
um, to just be able to balance this feeling that I was having in the outside world and the pain that I thought to feel uh, within me. And that gave me some security um, or stability, let's say. Uh, but then also, um, how can I construct my day so that I'm not just simply, let's say, providing myself, but also intaking. Um, so what is it that I can do to learn more? What is it that I can do to develop my own self in this kind uh, of constriction or, or in a way isolation that I was experiencing? Um, so I started to, uh, from you know, different channels, whether that's YouTube or, or looking at different online classes uh, to then recognize, okay, I can provide myself with a lot of knowledge and knowing. And I think I shifted um, um, from just yeah, providing into also intaking. And then um, uh, also what f happened finally was then I just couldn't stare into the camera anymore. Then I started to realize, okay, I'm now, you know, uh, taking in so much. I'm, uh, it's wonderful. I'm learning. I'm, I'm uh, able to, um, to, to fulfill myself on that way. But I was then just looking into the camera the whole time. So sometimes being the one that's providing, but then also taking in, which led me, I think, to, I think six weeks in now, then thinking, okay, this isn't happening either. <laughs> I need to have real downtime and, um, and construct uh, my day, uh, not only with the one hour at the beginning, but also to provide my day with a connection with my partner, having lunches or dinners, um, uh, being very much more um, also on the phone and not through cameras uh, with relatives and friends and having that time of really real connection um, that uh, obviously wasn't in physical um, or in social contact. Um, so what I've learned out of this is, um, I think, the beauty of connection. Um, and yes, of course, through camera or through these uh, um, video um, formats, we do have connection, but also to have connection with myself and with the immediate, in this case, with my partner, rituals of connection, lunches, dinners, how to... Um, how to cook something again with pleasure, with time, with, um, with uh, sincerity of just being there and not because, oh, now I've come home, now I have dinner. Um, and I've really begun to appreciate, um, yeah, that kind of being with one another um, and recognizing how I wasn't really appreciating that in that way. Um, meaning appreciating connection with one another and um, knowing that this is actually the most important thing we have in life. Um, and equally sort of coming back to um, uh, your talk, even in Umbria, recognizing that we're connected with everything. Um, and as you said, uh, you know, we're in constant and exponentially we're in change, uh, but if we recognize that and recognize the other, then I think we're able to, to maneuver through that. We're able to manage through that because we're in connection. Um, and whatever, anything, whatever comes at us, um, we can deal with uh, because we know we're part of it. Um, I'm not sure if that makes sense, but... Um, yeah, uh, it makes perfect sense. You used um, a couple words there that um, I want to maybe go deeper into. You so you use discipline, a disciplined routine, a schedule, and then a rigid, almost a rigid type of a schedule. You know, something mm -hmm. that's consistent that you can plan on, that you can count on. A lot of people see those has a scary, limiting, prison type of words. Mm. Discipline is something you do in the army or if you're a policeman or, you know, uh, certain professions. Um, but what I've learned, and I'm sure you've learned this as well, and I just want our listeners not to get fearful of those, those words or to, um, to see them in the right light. It's actually, when you have discipline, it's freedom. Mm. 
discipline and that routine, that rigidity in some respects, you think, okay, boy, uh, that's limiting a prison or this, uh, you know, this nine to five. It's actually freedom because it gives mm -hmm. you the freedom to have more time in other parts of that 24 hour day. It gives you more freedom and the health and well being, your personal resilience, so that when times like this come, you can bounce back quicker. You can know how to deal with those and handle those. Um, so I wanted to go into that. And then I wanted to ask you, um, so now you've, you've uh, kind of realized that uh, the importance of cherishing the moments of cooking and spending time with your partner and, and to doing all these things. Did you also realize by chance or have any thoughts or feelings around that a lot of the time that we give towards what we call work or away from the home or doing, earning our daily bread, um, that it could be done in a much shorter work mm -hmm. week, a much mm -hmm. shorter time. It could also be very disciplined that maybe instead of 40 hour work week that we could do the same amount of work maybe in 20 hours and then shift that other 20 hours into something that's personal development into personal lives and, and things and have that nice work-life balance that harmony that so works tries to help leaders with um, i know a lot of big organizations they're realizing wow We've had these huge expensive office space and actually they aren't needed at all. Exactly. And a waste of time, a waste of meetings. We've accomplished the same amount of work and, you know, uh, without that building and our employees are happier with their family. Some aren't, mm -hmm. but uh, th there's that change. Have you had any ahas or any learnings from there you could share with us? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I, uh, I'll, first of all, I'll stay with myself and then, uh, and then go into the work uh, and then some um, thoughts from my clients as well. Mm. So yeah, I, absolutely. I think um, uh, having this uh, sort of day set up um, is, as you said, it does provide freedom. It also has given me this sense of presence uh, knowing that I have this now and then in the next moment this is what I'm doing so I'm far more present uh, with uh, when I when I know that there's a certain timetable uh, that I'm going through and I don't mean by that calendar and the calendar of events but just there's a certain set of routines uh, that are in my day that um, I'm not going to um, uh, not going to miss uh, anymore could be um, your own personal rhythm of life. So that's like there's right. a that's circadian right. rhythm. I think there's also each individual has some kind of a rhythm where we function at our best potential, our flow. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I know that one of my personal development areas is to not be so engulfed in my work. Um, so I'm still working on the, how can I reduce my time from 40 to 20 hours, if at all, um, you know, if I just take those hours. Um, but I do see um, an absolute opportunity, both for myself, but also for others, that we don't need to work as much as we work. And we provide um, uh, work always seems so hard. Um, uh, when we take the term work, it's, it feels like oh, I have to work. You know, well, that's, uh, that's, that's hard work. Um, and in fact, uh, when it's in a flowing sort of format and um, it is uh, embedded in uh, a, a routine, uh, I do believe that we can reduce the amount of time that we think um, we need to add to work. What I have experienced in the online world is, and now coming to you know, buildings and do we even need buildings uh, where people gather to do work together, uh, I've certainly, I certainly experienced in this time that um, having sessions online is far more um, effective. Uh, we seem to have a clear agenda and we go through this and we come out with the results that we were looking for at the beginning. Um, uh, with the, uh, with the, the downside, at least, that I'm experiencing from my clients, um, organizations that then say uh, it's we've become um, very calendared uh, and we don't give ourselves enough space in between. 
so it seems to be very effective, but we're also draining ourselves because we're not providing that upfront social interaction or we're not really caring uh, for what the other is either feeling today or is uh, how that person is in this, has arrived in this meeting. Um, so transitioning this very effective way of working because now we only have that one hour slot um, to actually giving ourselves still space and time to connect with one another and to acknowledge each other uh, in where they're at at the moment or how they're feeling. Um, so this, was, this is, has been a shift that I'm seeing in my clients and how we're also interacting uh, with our clients. Um, now to the buildings, that certainly you know, is a conversation uh, that I'm hearing um, uh, around, um, again, our work and uh, thinking, how does purpose uh, really tie into the measures of how we uh, convene and how we meet? And do we need space, physical space, uh, to enable our purpose to uh, come to fruition? And I, my opinion there is, is as with many things, um, an easy answer, but is a hybrid of both. I don't see the building um, disappear, but I do see the way that how we will utilize our building space or physical space um, will shift. Um, and that we don't need to have uh, you know, desks or open spaces uh, for people to come together and, and just simply do their own work. I think there will be flexibility in that, um, but more so I would hope for our spaces to, in a way, um, yeah, become um, the baristas, uh, social gatherings um, where ideas can be played upon each other and extended where we can create things together um, and uh, as well as just have share time um, together. Uh, but do we need to be in the office to simply do our work? Um, no, uh, and for some it may still want to be that, but um, I think predominantly most of us will start to realize that we can work at any time, we can work from any place and um, we will still be connected assuming we give each other that time of presence and willingness to hear each other out on, on an emotional level as well as um, on a um, yeah, doing level as well, obviously. We have a mutual friend, uh, Tim Lieberecht, uh, who wrote The Business Romantic and does a uh, Romantic Society, I believe mm. it is, and you're involved in that as well. But uh, it's, uh, and also, I think it was 2016, you did this Humans of New Work project or right. uh, initiative, uh, which I was lucky enough to partake in. So you and I have been, not only have we, do we have friends that are very tech savvy or in the digital space or thinking about the future of work, we've been thinking about this a long time and Hopefully, we've been applying our thoughts and our ideas into practice and implementing them for ourselves so that this transition to be within our, our, our four walls or into a different environment to work hasn't been that detrimental of a transition, but we truly need to um, continue to think about you know, what's the future of work? How does that look like? How, not only how many hours, but what kind of tools we use. One thing that's so vital is we are social beings. We, we need each other, whether we hate all our colleagues at work or not, we still need some form of social interaction with our clients and our colleagues to some degree to, to have that feedback, that learning, the training, whatever it may be to grow but doesn't need to be 40 hours, I totally doubt it. So, so there's mm -hmm. some interesting things we've been thinking about for a long time. I really not only want the rest of the world to, to truly make this digital transformation into the, the future of digital technologies of how we can work and get better efficiencies and better performance of our time management and also these wasted things that we do that are so unnecessary, it could be resolved through a template or through some form of automation or digitization that is really not always becoming or worthy of the human mind or our human actions that are, right. we're just simply working for the almighty dollar or the almighty euro. 
Um, so I, I think we've thought about that and there is that transition. We're seeing some of that uh, uh, come about and, and that is uh, perfect for our leading into the next question. So in your, your biography and uh, you know, you've worked in New Delhi, London and, and, and Germany and all over, has that and your your family life and, and that in any way made you a global citizen or given you this feeling of different languages and different citizen citizenry and how would it feel for you to live in a future without borders nations walls limitations um, holding humanity back from from being socially together as a symbiotic earth. How, what, share your thoughts or your feelings or your ideas on, yeah. on this with me. Yeah. So, you know, I, I actually don't know if you know this, but I was born in Pakistan um, and, uh, and then moved to London um, or to England rather um, at the age of three. So I cannot say that I really experienced Pakistan. But I, but I do feel as though that made some kind of imprint on my, on myself. Um, and then, as you said, you know, um, uh, work-wise, I've, I've had the chance to work in different spaces, uh, in different places, in different countries. And um, I've, I think, I've always had this mindset of we're all one sort of species. Uh, I've never believed to have made any difference uh, wherever I have been. Um, uh, the, the individuals that I meet are, you know, the same as I, uh, irrespective of um, color or of um, um, sort of where, where, where each of us have come from. Um, so for me, it's natural to see that we uh, are, you know, are globally relevant and not uh, in any way diminishing each other um, through status or through um, origin. Um, I, what I do, and I think this has to do with my own personal history, and by that I mean my ancestors, what I do find in my own self is that it's um, important for me to understand my own history and where I've come from and Maybe even in my case, I can track down values uh, back to 12th century and, uh, and somehow I feel um, uh, um, ingrained in some way through that, but that doesn't make me in any way different or uh, in any way um, special uh, uh, to any other human being. Um, uh, I, but I, But yeah, I do see uh, for me, it's so important to know that that history uh, that where I, where my family, let's say, comes from, um, uh, and that's just data for me. That uh, that in parts, uh, you know, is is part of my whole whole beingness. Mm. But I would love to um, I would love to see a world that is uh, more peaceful with one another. And as you um, rightly said, you know, just beginning with our own bodies and each cell and how we're continuously transforming ourselves, um, I think we need to see the full planet so interconnected with one another and with that, our own species. Um, and we, uh, uh, anything that we provide into this planet will, will have ripple effects into other places on this planet. So let's all treat it as uh, cliche as it may sound, but let's treat it as one. And uh, there is um, uh, there is no reason um, except for our ego to start to differentiate that. And if we want our ego to uh, push that forward, then um, then we'll start to see more harm than uh, more peace in this world. Thank you. Do you um, believe that? That could be a future that we could realize by 2030, 2050, mm. one without nations, borders, and divisions. I'm not saying the removal of cultures. I'm not mm. saying the removal of governing nations, so to say. I'm just saying 
one where we are global citizens. We can mm -hmm. go everywhere. We can help everyone and that we're unified as the homo sapien, the, the homo mm -hmm. symbiosis, the symbiotic earth. Mm -hmm. I am, um, I, I would hope so. And, and, uh, and yet, uh, I think there is a, uh, it's a, it's a, uh, a, a, a big aspiration to have, but my hope is definitely there. Um, the pandemic, I believe has given us an opportunity to see it that way and that we are all um, you know, we will, are all affected by this pandemic and um, we therefore should be stepping into this notion of um, supporting and, uh, and including, including each other um, in solutions. Mm. However, um, I also see that uh, there is still a large sense of ego and I don't want to diminish the ego per se, we can have that conversation in a moment, but um, we still have a good sense of ego and um, that means that we're predominantly then uh, driven by um, what's in it for me and not necessarily how can we provide for each other. So again, it's a, it's a large aspiration. I would, I would want to provide my contribution to it. However, it does mean, and now we come back to my mission, um, it does mean that we first of all should um, put light or shed light on our own selves and see, well, where is my mental uh, state in and um, is what kind of hygiene can I provide to myself so that I can openly and willingly provide myself to others and not just think about it as what's in it uh, for me. Um, now, again, it's uh, 2030, huge aspiration, uh, 2050. I really do hope that we could get into that direction. Um, and uh, I want to keep up my, my, uh, my sense of um, opportunity and, and hope, but um, yeah, there's, there's, enough um, dynamics to tackle uh, in order to uh, get to that goal. Do you believe that there is a roadmap or plan out there, a global roadmap or plan that is out there, um, whether it's, you know, to 2030 to 2050, whether it's even the next five years, there's a few out there we might have heard of that, you know, the, the new Green Deal and the EU, and the in Germany and and the sustainable development goals, as you know. But for mm. you personally, do you believe that there's a plan and roadmap that uh, is for everyone on this planet, or that you you're you're hopeful towards or working towards? Yeah, I'm. Um, so for me personally, again, the um, yeah, the plan that I that I am working towards is really <clears throat> to allow individuals um, and individuals within a collective, i.e. an organization, to be and live who they truly are. And the reason why that is my plan um, is because I believe that if we achieve <clears throat> or gain that sense of knowing and therefore being and living who we are, then um, then we'll recognize uh, that we're part of a larger whole. And uh, there is nothing for my own self to gain. There's only something to gain as a, as a, as a human species or as a, as a group, as a, as a collective. Um, um, and if philosophically we could even think it further and say, well, actually, even in that, there's nothing to gain. Um, uh, I, it could simply be, let's have, um, let's ensure that our lives are full of joy and that we're really living our lives and leaving this planet, uh, again, a little bit cliche said, but leaving this planet a little bit better than how we found it when we came to this planet. That's the only, I think, uh, but again, it's more on a philosophical level, of course, we have plenty to be doing in this world um, 
But at the highest level, for me, it's like, really, we're here to enjoy, uh, but to uh, know that our enjoyment is there to leave this planet a little bit better than how we arrived here. Um, and in order to get there, I think, and this again is my plan, um, is to bring people back to that space of knowing who they are and um, how they can live their lives that feels purposeful to them, but uh, obviously is of purpose uh, to others and um, is providing whatever it is that this individual or that this group of uh, individuals uh, wants to uh, bring into the world. So in, in Umbrio at Eremito, um, that was a Benedictine monastery um, yeah. with a strong, every morning uh, there was a form of uh, scripture reading and, and uh, meditation, so to say. Mm -hmm. And they uh, really around this uh, uh, Catholic type of uh, Pope Francis, um, direction which, which is fine but what the reason i bring it up is because when he found that location it was basically in ruins and he left the place better than he found it because he rebuilt up what others had let go to ruins or left behind and uh, restored it and turned it into a beautiful place uh, keeping uh, the history and the ideas of the original creators to some respect, but also going well above and beyond and creating something, leaving it better than he found it, not only as there are water pumps and solar panels and renewable energy and battery backup and, and, mm -hmm. and, and it's a beautiful place to connect with nature and hardwoods and natural stones and, and be out uh, close to streams and, and all sorts of beauty. Um, but it's a place to to do a reset. And so he was very ingrained and, and interested in sustainable transition and doing things renewable way um, that when we got right down into um, one of the mornings after the readings uh, of the scriptures, I said, you know, Pope Francis wrote a beautiful encyclical about our earth and how we can protect our earth and leave it better than we found it and what our our responsibilities and stewardship is around our earth and i said it might be well versed to to read that as well because mm -hmm. that's already in the mindset and the direction and the, and the the progress it's a real time uh, encyclical wisdom from the latest pope moving forward and so i, I liked that connection because there are human beings on this planet that do everything they can to leave our world better than before that think about sustainable innovations and methods and tools to not only reconnect human beings to nature but also to to do things in a in a slightly different way without waste thinking about human health and, and our environment to improve that that leads into the biggest plan of action and way we can leave our planet better than we found it. Mm. And that is the global moonshot, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Mm. And it is the world's first global historical precedence and um, plan for our earth to get us to 2030. Absolutely. If we embrace it, if we do it and, and it is a system. I also spoke about this in Umbria. Mm -hmm. And um, what we're seeing during this pause and this reset is that those who have applied it, those who have put it into their business models, into their lives, they're realizing just like a form of meditation, just like an action of moving towards a better system to leave our planet better than we found it, it's also a guide and a roadmap to, to get us there. And so in, in um, this symbiotic earth, this connection we have to nature and our planet and leaving it a better place, what a, for me, a corporation, an organization, a small medium business is, it is an organism. It is the 
the the much the sum of all its parts mm -hmm. working together holistically in harmony towards the bigger goal mm -hmm. it's a, not only an organism it's an organization and it's what can help us exponentially as well going back to that to reach mm -hmm. that and and what would seem like this decade of action that's really difficult to do and i know you know in some respects this uh, evangelist or preacher in some respects for the the sustainable development goals but i truly mm -hmm. believe that if we apply them we'll also see these principles these things that you're talking about in soul works and in your workshops that they're really intertwined and connected and, and the thing i said in one of my last podcasts uh with um my guess was that really they were presented to us wrong. We didn't, one, realize that it was a historical precedence that so many countries came to together and agreed on a roadmap and plan for us, but we didn't understand that they were for us. They weren't for countries, <laughs> for cities, for, they were for us as individuals to make our life better and to get back into living within our planetary boundaries. Right. And right. so, uh, you know, go ahead and make the world better, and I dare you, you know, type of a thing. So uh, it's going to be so miserable if we reach them because our world's going to be so great and have an infrastructure and equality and many things will just disappear when we, when we think that way. Yeah. But um, by doing nothing at all or thinking, well, we're still waiting for the plan or we're still doing that, I think just like religion, just like um, many other things, uh, if we use that as a guide, as a help to understand and give us enlightenment or uh, something to, to use as a tool that we might not have known before, we'll be really surprised by the results. And mm. I don't want to go off too much of a tangent, but that I definitely believe there is a, a plan for. But I do have a question yeah. for you <laughs> since, um, sure. uh, uh, yeah, I always love the passion uh, that you have, um, for the, obviously, for, for the topic of uh, the SDGs, but also uh, in general to really uh, bring our awareness out. Um, and my question to you uh, would be, do you, do you see different cultures, uh, maybe uh, reducing it to countries um, who you know, are seeing it as a guide and who are then internalizing it and then um, uh, in organizations uh, bringing it to fruition and then other cultures that are seeing it more like um, a here's what you have to do and therefore they don't adopt and therefore they're not um, yeah not taking this amazing opportunity into their hands um, yeah is there a certain mentality or a mindset that you that you could uh, pinpoint uh, and say well you know if there's a mindset of security or um, results driven then that makes it harder for, for the SDGs to be incorporated as a guiding point um, so in, in a lot of respects I, I, do, I do have the answer for for you the in a lot of respects um, the SDGs were presented to us wrong, but they are also created kind of more for the developed world, the Western mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the language in those developing countries, the SDGs weren't translated right away and, and or maybe not understood. Um, and those who are suffering from poverty and hunger and inequality and suffering from conflict or a refugee uh, are definitely not thinking about the SDGs in their path. They're thinking about where their next meal is going to come from, if they're going to have a, a dry place to sleep, uh, if mm -hmm. they're going to have health and security and, and many other things that they've just lost their home, whatever the situation may be. Mm -hmm. And so it's really for us to, to help and provide a, a governance and a restructure for our world so that there is no inequality, so that everyone mm -hmm. has access to clean drinking water and food and it does not go without hunger that we change mm -hmm. our, our models. And one big, um, not misnomer, but misunderstanding with the sustainable development goals is that it is a global plan. And in order to reach it, it has to be almost a global reset or a global new operating system. Mm -hmm. So 
uh, global economies need to change, global food systems need to change, global uh, equality and structures need to change. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't mean we have to get rid of nations and borders and, and those, those mm -hmm. restrictions. It just means that as humanity, we unify ourselves on this global operating system that we will let no other human being suffer or uh, feel uh, uh, unequal or less lesser of a person and not give them the universal basic rights and entitlements that that mm. everyone should have mm. uh, and, and what some governments cities or or peoples don't understand is that it is not just a tweak on business as usual it is a completely no global system you know um, that's the first thing the secondly what i've seen specifically into your question is that I've dealt with indigenous people all over the world and I've been lucky enough to Thailand and the Philippines and, and uh, Chad and, uh, uh, and Ethiopia and, and um, Uganda and many other places in Africa and um, in uh, Morocco and also in, in uh, Middle Eastern countries where there's all different levels of social status and, and development mm -hmm. and non-development, whether and, and um, south america and uh, different places of the world where there's indigenous peoples that um have no clue that there's you know there that there's such a thing a plan or the sdgs mm -hmm. and um in some respects some of them are relying on their leadership of their country leader their community leader or their tribe as an indigenous species their tribal leader and for each of them, the sustainable goals are different. The way that we speak about them is also a lot different because we don't say you need to do number one and number two SDG and number three, mm -hmm. no poverty, zero hunger, quality education. And, you know, we talk about them and say we, we'd like to show you a different way of doing things that is a little bit more environmentally friendly, but it will also bene benefit you with basic inalienable rights and, and infrastructure so that you can have energy, so that you can cook, so that you can have a reading light at night to get educated, that you can, uh, uh, you know, whatever the situation is in that mm -hmm. specific area. A unique case that we had in the, in the Philippines, and uh, sorry to say, this is one of the tragedies during the pandemic. Senator Alvarez from the Philippines passed away and, uh, it's uncertain whether it was because uh, of his age and, and the pandemic because of COVID-19, uh, but he was in the hospital for a long time and then did pass away. But he was one of the best advocates have been around since the very first COP, the Conference of the Parties, the UN Climate Conference, and has done numerous things for the people of the Philippines. But his, uh, he and I and, and many others worked on a program called um, the SDG soap opera. So I want to give you a little insight into the culture of the Philippine people. So people don't even have a house, they don't have a, a bed to lay in, but all of them uh, go to these corner markets or these corner places where TVs on these, you know, these old TVs, maybe even black and white, and they can watch these soap operas. And in the soap operas in, in the Philippines, they sing uh, uh songs and they make it fun and they dance and, and uh that's a big thing around the culture of the philippines and they created the sdg soap opera so that to educate people in a normal way or with songs and culture to teach them about different things with the sdgs but they didn't go specific into the numbers but it was the same message behind the sdgs in their local language because it's very specific um, to, to, to how they live um, and, and believe it or not in Thailand as well um, they have you know it's the world's kitchen and they do a lot with food and it's just a beautiful place but they have done a lot around sustainability and their uh, King Ram the ninth um, uh, not the current king but the one before did this uh, sufficiency uh, economy type of a, a model and it's very closely tied to the sustainable development goals which need to be tied into you know how we can present that to them so 
the UN and those countries who came up with them, it was up to them not only to meet the standards and to implement them in their infrastructures, but also to disseminate the, the knowledge and the wisdom on how to apply them to our lives. Right. Um, and it's different for indigenous and locals and people all over the world. But what I can tell you is that those who do get it and who do implement this, it's just a better operating mm -hmm. system for your life. It envelops mm -hmm. religion and beliefs and discipline that we talked about and, and mm -hmm. a regimen of doing things. And you realize that not only do you create a different human zoo, but you create a different lifestyle for yourself. Mm -hmm. And when people hear the word sustainable or an even sustainable development, they don't mm -hmm. understand that it means to sustain yourself for future generations that you'll have health that you'll have food that you'll have energy for future mm -hmm. generations that you'll be around be able to do it in 10 years and then 20 years and that it's just a better operating system for life and it's mm -hmm. and once we reach the sustainable development goals that it's a solid infrastructure to springboard off of mm -hmm. will it solve all our problems is it the silver bullet Absolutely not, because we're beyond the limits to growth and whatever happens uh, today, we usually don't see the climate or environmental effects for another 10 years. Same mm. to go for those who lived 10 years ago or 20 years ago, mm. we're still seeing the effects of the pollutions and destruction that they did mm. then. And that's why what you said with it's um, important to leave this planet better than we found it. A lot of companies, a lot of organizations say in their business annual reports and their business models, what they say is um, we're reducing our carbon emissions by 60 or 70 percent this year. By 2024 or 2022, we're going to go plastic free. Uh, they're telling us what they're going to do in the future or, or what percentage they've done now. But what they're telling us is nothing. What they're telling us, they're still doing harm. They're still doing things bad that are affecting our environment. They're just doing it a lot less. Mm -hmm. And eventually they're going to stop. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is even if the entire world were to stop today, it doesn't leave our planet better than we found it. it mm -hmm. It's only stopped to continue, but our planet has pollution, plastic, and is continuing to warm. Mm -hmm. So we need to, as organizations, as human beings, truly apply this golden rule, treat people and planet how we want it to be treated, but leave it, just like you said, better than we found it, and go in the positive direction mm -hmm. of cleaning that up and keeping it in a circular economy. Because mm -hmm. if you look at our world from outer mm -hmm. space, there is no throw away. What, what people are realizing is that's a better operating system because in keeping things in a closed circular economy, there's always resources, always business. There's tons of things just in that digital or automotive transition of all the cars and materials and metals and things that need mm -hmm. to be transitioned over to a renewable type of vehicle. Um, we can't do like we did when the Berlin Wall came and just drive our trabbies to the border and leave them for someone else mm -hmm. to clean up. We have to figure out ways to repurpose that, mm -hmm. those metals, those parts, mm -hmm. those things mm -hmm. in all aspects of our world. There'll be mm -hmm. plenty of jobs and plenty of resources. We mm -hmm. just have to think differently about them. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm sorry to, to go on, but I'm sure you've got some ideas and feedback yeah. for me on. on well, that. no, th I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, thank you. Thank you for this. There's a number of responses that I have. One is uh, going into the organizations that I'm working with and just seeing that, uh, that shift. And I'll come to that in a moment. But I just wanted to make the comment, uh, as you said, you know, when you zoom out and you look at the planet, um, you know, where, where is it meant to go? It, it's all, it's all in, you know, it's all there and we have to see it um, as circular and that it's, um, yeah, we can't throw anything away. Where is it meant to go? But the same is this, the comment I wanted to make, the same is just for our own system, our own uh, body mind uh, system. Um, you know, we, we, we feel as though we can just gurgitate bad words out of our mouths, right? But it will come back and the system, uh, our own body system will, uh, will hold on to this kind of behavior um, and, we'll, and we'll see some kind of reaction in our own body through this. Um, 
you know, going as far as illness uh, because we're feeding our brain with so much ill uh, words uh, that it will manifest in some format. It can't just go out and never be, you know, never come back uh, again. It's, it's all part of the system. So um, for me, it, it, uh, we need to start with our own mental health in order to then know that I'm taking care of my own self, which will then generate um, well-being for others and will then generate well-being for many generations to come. Um, so I just want to make that point that uh, uh, to, to see it also that we're our own little planet as in this body that uh, I've been given um, and this body will, uh, you know, can only uh, digest so much. It will, it will hold on to anything that doesn't seem right and you'll, you'll experience it in some form or manner uh, at a later stage uh, if you don't deal with it. Um, but uh, yeah, moving it into organizations and uh, into a, a sort of my, my experience, my positive experience, and particularly um, uh, speaking, we spoke a little bit before we um, kick-started today um, that I was, uh, you know, first time again had uh, yesterday a physical um, or rather a, um, a, a workshop in, in, in a space, in a physical space, and where we gather together, obviously, with all of the corona necessities uh, taking that into account uh, but what was just really beautiful for me to experience was again um, how this pandemic has you know um, started to shift people's minds and that the right questions are being asked um, and that there is a consciousness there now or a, 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 a um, language or uh, openness for this type of language to appear in a work setting, which I was just like, ah, you know, as as terrible as uh, the situation has been for many of us uh, globally, and uh, how um, how we've all had our own experience in the in the um, thicket of when it was it being experienced. Um, how wonderful to see that it has rejigged ourselves um, and particularly in a collective particularly then uh, in my example in an organization that one is um, you know speaking and not just at leadership level but at a um, at a level uh, because these workshops involve a good set of people who represent the full organization so across um, culmination of, of different people how it's just in every every in this case, at least in every person's mind, um, you know, how can we provide towards what the SDGs are outlining for us? Um, but also, what does that then mean for us? How, how do we sustain our well-being within the organization? What can we gather around as a group of people to really shift ourselves collectively forward? And it's, for me, that then has been because it was the first time to be in a in a room with um 30 plus people and uh and have this conversation since uh since the pandemic and i'm like yes we're on the right path um and as you said organizations are beginning to embrace um uh i can only speak of organizations here in the western or in the uh, developed world um but it it makes me feel um very helpful uh and that we have accelerated our level of um of our mindset our level of consciousness which is good <laughs> it is very good with that experience that you had leads me to the next question but i, I want to caveat it um so if we push current business models or operational models out, whether they're a workshop or an event, or if they're a true organizational business model, and we push them out five years, 10 years, 20 years into the future, based upon what's in their plans and their organizational structure, we can pretty well see what the path of the future that they're going in is going to look like because it's it's a plan or a roadmap it's a mission and there's over time some tweaks or changes in that which would mean uh in this experience that you had in your workshop we've heard 
that there could be a second wave of the pandemic. We also are pretty strong at knowing that there will probably be other pandemics, maybe even worse, down the road. Um, and that they're coming not from China, not from Wuhan, but they're coming because of our environmental and ecological encroachment on, on nature and on certain places. And, and it's um, messing with our biome, which is messing with the way viruses appear and are transmitted around our world. So we've got social distancing, we're wearing masks. Is the future of that model dystopian? The next step is gas masks, the next is oxygen masks, the next step is spacesuits, the next step is we're gonna be like the kids in the bubble, you know, we're gonna be bubble people. Uh, um, what is, and, and that leads me to the question, the burning question, WTF, and it's not the swear word, it's what's the future mm. for you? Not for everybody else, what's the future? Do you, uh, uh, can you tell us that? Yeah. So I, um, I'm trying to see in, in what context I would put it in, what's the future? Um, for me, the future is, uh, and I'm going to take us back to the beginnings of our conversation, or at least the beginnings of uh, when we spoke about what was my experience uh, during the pandemic. Um, for me, the future is about being far more locally or far more locally grounded and having the experience uh, be more intense in the relationships and the connections uh, that I uh, and therefore we uh, have in our direct uh, vicinity. And I, and, I, and I see this future to be more um, uh, appreciative of what we have with one another in this local environment. Now, I, I don't see in that future that we're not going to be experiencing other parts of the world. I do see that we will consciously uh, want to engage in um, in um, yeah in experiencing the world, uh, but uh, knowing that we're doing this to either provide something or that we will receive something back in in uh, or it's a return for something we've given. Um, so uh, I, I uh, so from a, so from families and friends, I think this sense of family, uh, but it's going to be more of a Mm, uh, uh, I know like a commune uh, is what I foresee um, and uh, that this sort of commune which will be friends and family that we really want to be together because we're generating more motion and opportunity together. Uh, in the world of work, the future, um, I you know uh, because you said with masks and with gas masks and then at some point we'll all be in a bubble um, uh, you know, I would, uh, again, uh, hope to see that um, based on our conscious beingness uh, in, in local environments, the way that we will work will uh, ensure that um, we're providing ourselves sensibly, obviously, um, uh, but we will not distance ourselves, um, maybe at some parts physically, yes, but we will not distance ourselves because we will begin to learn that we are providing for something bigger, i.e. more purposeful and more impactful in this life. And we will therefore, um, I don't, I would say, I, 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 the word is in my head risk, but it, um, it, the word risk has a bad connotation. Um, uh, we will uh, we will forego this risk um, because we know we're doing it for something better. Um, uh, therefore, we will do everything that we can um, connect with each other more emotionally, but also for the sake of something bigger and. Um, yeah, not um, not overemphasize because I just have this image now of these gas masks and everything. We won't be there because it's we will want to do it for something bigger than ourselves. Um, again, that may take the risk of um, uh, having to deal with 
viruses and things we cannot even foresee today. Um, but if we're doing it not to save myself, but to provide it for a better uh, way of being together or a well-being uh, for one another and for generations to come, yeah, then we will, um, um, yeah, we'll, we'll risk coming together. But as I said, my, my key notion is I think I would want to live more locally uh, and that means you know, food uh, and uh, providing for, uh, for, for my direct environment far more than uh, to uh, look to the benefits of uh, having food and goods be transported uh, globally. Mm, yeah, I would consciously choose where I want to be in this world and, uh, and then when and, when and where I travel to, hopefully with a consciousness, I'm, I'm either giving something back or I'm receiving something in return uh, for, uh, for partaking uh, on this journey. You and I um, both teach for a couple of different institutions and belong to some similar organizations. And I, I also mentioned this when I was talking about the Philippines and indigenous people. Um, we need to first take a, care of the basic needs, our own health, our own well-being, our, our, our get our own balance and stability and sustainability for ourselves. And then it puts us in a unique place, just like you mentioned in the first three weeks of this lockdown, that you were in a unique place that you were reaching out to, to clients and friends and others and, and you know, bolstering and trying to help them and, and, and you know, do other things. And then, then it affected you without that base, without uh, uh, having that so say resilience or that sustainability yourself that there's many different types of resilience um, mm. but uh, having that personal resilience and that being you're going to be okay tomorrow you're going to make it through this uh, thing then you can't help others and first you first you've got to help yourself and focus on you and your family that's what you're saying first the community and local and then as that is strengthened and all those around you and yourself have that resilience and that strength, then you can start to look outside and really help mm -hmm. other human beings. And, and that's mm -hmm. how it is for everybody on the wor world. If, if you don't have that yourself, then you can't help anyone else. Mm -hmm. And you're looking for help yourself. You're looking for handouts and, and food or monies or whatever it is just to survive day to day. Um, with one of the places that we teach or give lectures or courses for is uh, uh, a big term that we use, resilient, desirable futures, plural. So different type of futures for different people and different cultures and different areas of the world, because it is really different for everyone else. And that's yeah. why I ask all my guests that question, because your futures are different than their futures. Um, and but in, in some of some ways, because we're all on the same planet, we're all homo sapiens in some respects, the, the overlying plan or the future needs to cross over and connect in, in many ways to, to get us there. So this resilient, desirable futures, um, and this is where I need to define the three different types of resilience. One resilience is if you're abused emotionally, physically, if you're sworn at or hit or, um, or, or ailing or sick, that you have the resilience to bounce back, the health to come back emotionally, mentally, uh, physically, to come back uh, resilience because you're in good health, you train, you understand whatever it may be. The second ty type is, a. Uh, uh, a, a dystopian resilience. And that's where I want to go into why I caveated what I said. I didn't say that the future will be gas masks and spacesuits and oxygen masks or bubbles. But if you have a current model or that's the current model today, and when the next pandemic comes, that's the model that we knew from before instead of fixing the problem so that we don't even have that model so that mm -hmm. there's a different form of resilience there, um, then that's, that's what's going to continue to repeat itself or it will be more extreme 
the next time because they'll say, remember COVID-19, this is much worse and we need, no, masks aren't gonna cover it. You need gas masks and, and full body suit, whatever it is, mm -hmm. because it's much, much worse. We didn't learn or we couldn't fix it from before. Something like mm -hmm. that, that's, that's not only, I look at it in a whole worldview, but it's that's what happens when you push these models out in the future. Mm, they mm. don't they grow exponentially. They don't grow in, in in a linear or lateral or different way where you say, okay, actually the next pandemic, we don't have to wear masks at all. We don't have to wear gloves. It doesn't usually go that way. Mm, uh, mm. And that and so the reason I gave that is that's why we need to know what the future is that's why we need to know what the plan is for mm. us and for humanity globally in the future so that we can avert mm. prepare ourselves and make sure that we can live in resilient desirable futures and that last definition of resilience is one where you still have energy tomorrow after a pandemic after a, a storm a climate catastrophe um, that you still have food and resources, that there's no hoarding, that um, the, those who are suffering the worst now are the ones in developing countries as it, it hits them not only first, but it also stays the longest and remains with them mm -hmm. the longest before their economies mm -hmm. and their lifestyle bounces back. Mm -hmm. um, so, I think, mm, yeah. Sorry, yeah, I was, um... You know, for me, it's um, it also has a lot to do with how much uh, fear and security each one of us then needs. And uh, I do, I think this sense of experimentation, uh, and as I said, the word risk, um, uh, maybe it's better to say, you know, just being in, in this continuous creation, co-creation, um, uh, knowing that, hey, we may be wrong, but let's stay curious, let's keep moving forward and uh, even when the next hit comes not to then divert to angst and and security um, and just you know completely uh, reel off and, and go into isolation still have this um, sense of we're in this together and let's um, remain in in a yeah in a in a creative mindset uh, so that we can work through this as well. Um, yeah, but I do think that um, because you, you brought up, you know, the Western world where it seems to linger on longest, um, at least in this pandemic, um, that we're so overconsumed that we can't see a different life. Um, we're unable to let go and go back to, um, let's say, the, the, the least that we need to feel joy in our life. Um, and I, yeah, I, I would like to believe that we can live life in joy without all of the luxury and the consumption that we particularly in uh, the worlds that um, I'm most, um, I've been most uh, um, situated in. That, yeah, that is not, that's not joy um, necessarily, or rather it's not joy. Um, we need to redefine that. And I think we gain joy in, in uh, helping others and in uh, providing for, uh, for the world um, beyond just our own little island, this zoo that we have here yeah, right now. <laughs> your, your zoo looks very nice. <laughs> My zoo does look nice. <laughs> um, uh, we're, we're very fortunate. So <laughs> I, I want to ask you what's next to expect from Compound Julia. So what are plans or things to be hopeful or optimistic that you're working on with your clients, yeah. more workshops and and things like Aramito, the being exponentially human or things like that. Is there some things that we can look forward to? Do you have mm. any movies, books, or things coming out that we can get excited about? 
Yeah, I think there's, well, there's one, definitely one mention, first of all, um, because uh, we've been speaking about Eremito and also about being exponentially human, and this would never have occurred without my wonderful partner, Diana, uh, Diana Galeazovic, who, um, uh, with whom, you know, this, uh, this offering, uh, this, this program uh, has been um, created with. And the two of us um, were very symbiotic with one another. Um, and uh, and really believe in this co-creation um, uh, and what is arising for the two of us is that we foresee a uh, what we're calling an inner wisdom MBA because again our our belief is is if we can create uh, mental hygiene in each one of us um, uh, then we are far more um, stronger or will be more impactful, more in, influential in a positive way um, and uh, more transformative uh, through that. So it's a, a nine month program uh, that we're looking to launch next year uh, here for Europe um, in order to also strengthen then our collective mindset in Europe and uh, enable a, um, yeah, uh, a stronger standing uh, uh, for us uh, in, 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 the, in the world as a whole. Beautiful. So yeah. uh, and maybe there's I, a book there as well. But. Great. I definitely <laughs> would recommend that to all of my listeners that uh, they get in touch with you and I'll put a link uh, in the description of the video and also on the podcast so that they can reach out to you to, to look at that. Uh, it's a wonderful experience and uh, not only does it fill your soul and give you the new view and, and tools that you need to move forward, it really extremely um, was a wonderful experience that I had, even though I was fortunate to be on both sides. So <laughs> not only speaking, but also experiencing as well. So yeah. that uh, leads me to my second and probably last hardest question that I have <laughs> for you. Um, and you, you've probably answered it in one way or another. I want to let you know it's different than the burning question, um, but in many respects also very, could be very similar. What does a world that works for everyone look like for you? Not for me, not for your organizations, not for your clients, but for you. Right. Yeah. That world looks, um, again, um, in a way, it is a little bit of a um, of a repeat, but that world for me looks um, yeah is it's all about compassion for one another. Um, I uh, I really do hope for myself uh, and the way that I um, view, look into the world and how I provide myself into the world is with compassion um, and. Equally, I would uh, see uh, the world for me to really grow and to flourish and to thrive when compassion is part, or if not the key to every interaction we have with ourselves and others. Is there one standard way or uh, one that shows up more often that you show compassion to others or uh, something that, you, you know, a story or something special that you you um, touch people that they know uh, that you're genuine and, and that it was coming out, anything that comes to mind? You know, the best way of, um, for me at least, to acknowledge my, my um, in compassion is when I recognize, and um, this may be difficult for um, individuals for us to acknowledge, but when I recognize that anything that comes out of my voice uh, or out of my mouth uh, as in verbalized isn't just here in my head so even this conversation i i am um i sense that it's not just i'm not logically thinking it's it's arising in me and it's providing itself and for me that's a very pure form um uh, my logic sometimes says oh, i could have used this word or that word that would have been far more business like or whatever um uh, but compassion um, it can only flow from the heart um, and uh, that means for me that it's uh, not just my logic and uh, it's not just my limbic system that's working 
It's actually pairing it together and uh, providing. Thank you. <laughs> if you uh, had this ties to your why, um, and I know you um, have some ties to Simon Sinek as well, the why course and uh, start with why things I, I do as well. We have uh, similar uh, whys as well. Um, if you had that opportunity to go up to a million individuals or even more than a million individuals individually, but mm. you could only depart one elevator pitch message to them, eye to eye, soul to soul, uh, with compassion, what would that message be? Yeah. Touch, your, um, touch and transform yourself to being who you really are. Thank you so much, Julia. That's all my questions and uh, I've enjoyed every moment of, of our time together. I, uh, I know our listeners will enjoy and I hope we have some other sessions in the future. Thank you Thank so you. much for your time and, and Thank you. uh, I <laughs> uh, um, wish you well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark.